Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of Deserted Island Dads. We're in the throes of summer, but hopefully this episode gives you a nice break from the heat and helps you pass the time until Rich and I return later in August. Speaking of August, before we get to the show, don't forget that Historic Fest is coming up August 19th through the 21st in Kansas City. Food and drink included in admission. We're playing war games, we're playing board games playing train games go check it out but that's enough other stuff to plug we're here to talk about board games and island getaways and whatever else may come up in this episode and this time i was joined by one half of rolling dice taking names marty uh i've been a fan of marty and tony for a number of years now and marty was nice enough to sit down and talk to me not only about his deserted island games but also his somewhat recent entry into the historical board game uh, side of the hobby. So sit back, enjoy that Mai Tai, enjoy the episode. We'll talk to you soon. Hello, friend, and welcome ashore to the island. You'll be happy to know that I think I saw Tony wash ashore a few days ago. He's probably waterlogged. Yeah, he looked a little a little like a little green. Uh, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. I was introduced to you and Tony, and we'll get to who you are in just a second here. When well, you just hear these two knuckleheads appearing on these guest <laughs> segments on the dice tower i was like oh, i gotta check these guys out wow that was man that was a long time ago i'm trying to remember what segments we did way back then it was a while ago before they quit doing um when they stopped doing like the guest contributions right oh i'm trying to remember there may have been a topic and then you could contribute to that topic mm. and they stitched everything together yeah okay okay maybe it was something like that anyways uh, I found I'm, I'm here with Marty, one half of the Rolling Dice and Taking Names uh, crew. Welcome, welcome, Marty. Matt, it is fantastic to be here. I am super excited about this. Thank you so much for reaching out to me to uh, come on and be a guest on the show. Yeah. So this is uh, this is the third segment of Deserted Island Dads. Which, if this is the first one you're listening to, uh, it's a very casual interview show where we talk about our Deserted Island games. Uh, other topics, why we why we play these games, why who we play with, and those types of things, and it's kind of worked out pretty interestingly. My first guest is a longtime historical conflict simulation war gamer. My second guest was someone who's been doing this for a few years now, and then Marty, what's what when I knew I wanted to interview you right away is um, I this over the past year year and a half correct me if i'm wrong this growing interest in historical board gaming yes it is probably been uh, a year and a half where i really started playing more of them it's one of those things that it was it was an aspect of board games i was always very interested in but intimidated by uh just because i remember we go to cons and there's always like a corner or a section of the open gaming area where the historical gamers get together and play. And it's like, they're playing the same game for hours, <laughs> moving little square pieces around on the board. I, and I say, that looks cool, but probably way too much for me. So I was always intimidated by it till about a year and a half ago. Uh, when I finally sat down and learned how to play a coin game, which is wow, wow Marty, it's like of all the historical games, you're just going to jump straight to a coin game. You know, there are a lot lighter ones to, you know, to tackle, but some reason I, uh, I've always been interested about what that is. I never understood what coin was, what it meant, and, uh, and so when I heard it, it's like, all right, I, I've got to at least see what this is. And then ever since then, I've been dipping my toe in a bunch of other different genres. So I've been like trying other things besides coin, uh, different uh, types of games and war games and historical games. Uh, I'm trying to to try to touch on each one of them and see which one I kind of like the best. Yeah, it's been it's kind of like been a snowball effect. Like I re I remember seeing maybe it was a David Thompson game or something that was the first one where I was like, oh hey, th those are like I I'm a I play everything, uh, Euro games, getting into miniature games, RPGs, you name it, and that's why we have all these topics. But war games is really what I I focus on these days. And then you know now it's like each month uh, I can look forward or each episode I can look forward to you and Tony talking about some more games. So what, what was the first coin game you played? Cuba Libra. Okay. 
Okay. You know, I can, I can actually go back before that. You know what really kind of uh, got me into the genre, and it was such a great introduction, was uh, you mentioned David Thompson. Uh, him, his Undaunted series with him mm-hmm. and Trevor Benjamin. Mm-hmm. We love deck builders. You're right. And it was like, oh, this is really cool. An historical deck building game, you know, World War II, a war game. And I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. I loved it. And I think that is such a good entry point into an historical theme or or war game because if you've been playing tabletop games for a while, you've probably come across a deck builder game. So that concept isn't foreign to you. I draw a hand of cards. I play off my cards. And when I don't have any more cards to draw, I shuffle my discard and draw again. And, and so if, you, if you know how to do that, then it's just learning the other aspects of how to use those cards within the context of the game. Right. Was there a natural... So from, from Undaunted, did you transition into his uh valiant defense series mm. like actually this year was the first year i played one of his valiant defense okay tony had one and played it last year and mm. i uh what was the name of it it was the polish themed one uh no that's not right that's the one i played no that's the one he played wow marty the postman did is Pavlov's the one that he had oh, yeah okay. and he tony has that one too the pavlov's thing uh-huh. But there was a Kickstarter that uh Labyrinths, no, La- Labyrinths Hill, Labyrinths Ridge. That's it. Uh was a Kickstarter recently, and I got a prototype of that, and I played that, and I thought that that is a really, really cool system too. It is uh, a lot of fun. We it actually just came up recently for us. Uh we were playing another solo game, and yeah, he's really got something cool there with the with the different scales. Uh, a big fan. But while we're on the topic of war games, let's just go ahead and get into it. I think the first deserted island game we should go ahead and touch on then is if you wash ashore and one of the five games that wash ashore for you has to be a war game, what do you pick? I see. Here's the thing. This was the toughest one for me to answer because I am so new to this style of game Mm -hmm. that uh, I was trying to think, you know, what's one that if I was on an island, I wouldn't get sick of. I assume there's somebody else there to play with me. I didn't ask if I'm by myself, if it's a solo type thing. So I, I assume that Tony who washed up on the shore will eventually gain consciousness. Don't have somebody to play with. <laughs> yeah. And this is one of those things that as the more I delve into the genre, I may change my mind. But right now I am so in love with the game Nevsky from oh. GMT, the Levy and campaign game. And the reason why I landed on this one and not like some of the other coin games that I played is because I feel there's a lot of replayability in this game. Number one, it's a two player game. So uh, that if there's no other body on the island, it's one of the person I have somebody to play with. Uh, It's scenario based. I wanted to make sure I picked a game that used scenarios so that every time I played, I could use a different scenario. Mm hmm. One thing I'm so intrigued with about Nevsky is it seems like it's a really cool mergence of a Euro style game and a, a war game because it's resource management is so important in that game. And that is like one of the major aspects so that you can go out and if you're going to do some fighting and conquering and stuff that you can be able to do that. And there's so much uh, emphasis put on making sure you have the right resources for mobilizing, for food, uh, having enough loot in order to be able to move into somebody's territory and successfully maybe take over a stronghold or something. So as of right now, I'm saying Nevsky, uh, just because the Levian campaign uh, system is just something I'm absolutely in love with. Well, I think that's a great choice. We're big fans. I do have a question for you because you're you're new to this side of the hobby. Did you was Nevsky a hurdle? Because yes. okay, and I've I found it was a hurdle for me, and and we've talked about it, and I, I can't always put my finger on it. I, like, am I afraid of losing leaders, or is it just these new concepts? It really kind of goes against the grain in a lot of different ways. You know, even just by not using counters, using blocks, which is still you know will m- make the the groggiest of grognards even saltier. So you had a hurdle as well getting into Nevsky. Very much so. I thought, okay, I've learned how to play a coin game. I can handle Nevsky. To me, the rules are much more 
tougher to learn in a levying campaign style game than in a coin because there are so many more actions and options that you have on your turn, even more so that I think than a coin game. Let's just use Cuba Labor for an example. You play a faction, you got is it was it four main factions you uh, four main actions you can choose from on your turn, and if you ha- and you might be able to do a special action to go along with it. Mm-hmm. So you learn those four, and that's it. Well, there's way more actions to choose from with the Nevsky, and there's so many what I call if then rules. Mm -hmm. Uh, If this happens, then this happens. If this happens, and and it's all could be in the same one. Like when you go into a battle, there are so many, the flow chart for a battle would just be absolutely insane because it's like, you're going to go in. Okay. uh, I'm going to attack. Okay. Do you want to retreat? No, I don't want to retreat. Okay. So we're going to fight. Are there archers? Okay. You're archers, you know, and you keep going back and forth and then it's like, okay, well this happened. And because this happened, I need to make a check here. And if I, it, it's just a lot going on instead of just, okay, uh, roll some dice out of your strength and see who died. Right. And I even found that even outside of battles, you know, when you go up to a stronghold, is it besieged? Is it mm-hmm. unbesieged? You got to put a siege marker. It, there's all these little things that's much more than, okay, move. Right. Oh, if I move and end up here, then I need to do something else because of where I landed sort of deal. So what season is it? You know, Mm -hmm. just so Mm -hmm. many things going on that it took me a long time to grasp. And I've been playing remotely with Ignacy Shevichek from Portal Games. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I have been really coaching each other back and forth on on how to play the game. And and the designer Volko Runga has, has been really helpful online answering questions and stuff. And we've played like three games and it's still, I'm still in the learning stage. I'm still not ready to sit down and go, okay, I really have a strategy or plan here. I'm doing what I still call pulling levers. Yes. How does this action work? Okay. I understand that. Okay. How does this action work? You know, that sort of deal. I think Nevsky is, and I am assuming that Almoravid should show up tomorrow. Mine's, um, uh, mine is too. Mine's showing up uh, tomorrow also. <laughs> I think the whole series is, especially when you're new to it, all those things you just listed, a a deeper level of rules, more in depth rules, as well as levers that you, and that was the hurdle for me. You need to see them pulled to know what the consequences are. Generally speaking, if I'm playing your most, you know, your typical hex encounter game, I know if I'm going to move here, we're going to fight and battle. But then. In Nevsky, if I move here, one, I need to check if I even can move there. <laughs> and then I need to consider the consequences of all, all the stuff you talked about, supply and loot for paying off guys to stay longer and all this stuff like factors in. It is a really wonderful system that I'm in- incredibly excited for. I think that's an excellent choice for the island. And, you know, it's also cool that uh, this is something I didn't know about. One thing I love about these historical games is learning about something I never knew. That's what's really drawn me into. I I know Castro came into Cuba and took it over, but I don't know how. I don't know why. And actually reading through the playbook and everything of Cuba Libra, I have a better understanding of that time period in history and what happened there. Well, now in Levy campaigns, I had no concept of what a, I've heard of Lords, but what's a Lord? Mm -hmm. And I always pictured, all right, this country is going to invade this country, but it wasn't that way back then. It was a Lord saying, Hey, I'm going to come over here. Does anybody want to join me? Well, sure. I'll come join you, but are you going to share some of that loot with me? Cause if you don't, I'll take my forces and going home. (laughs) You know, that's like, Whoa, I didn't realize that's how it was back then. So just that alone is interesting. And now with the different levy and campaign games coming out, I get to learn about different time periods and different conflicts between other groups. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but that does make me wonder, are there any of the announced, and there are several of them, like 15 to 20, mm-hmm. announced levy and campaign titles that you've seen and say, oh, that that's the one, that's the one I'm looking forward to. I'm actually excited about one called Henry because uh-huh. it's a lighter entry level. Yep. And I'm excited because maybe that's one I can get the table and play quicker. But I also think that will be the one that people point to and get, oh, you want to try this system? Go by Henry. Nice. That's good. Um, I just, a couple months ago, we talked about a GMT series called Men of Iron, which is mm-hmm. 
Um, you just you just played uh, Commands and Colors Ancients, right? Correct. Men of Iron is about two steps past Commands and Colors. It's still relatively light in terms of like um, there's a series called Great Battles of History that's like really in depth tactical that time period of battle. But Men of Iron's a, a ton of fun. Um, and there's the reason I'm bringing this up is because Henry covers the same time period, um, uh, Agincourt and, oh. but men of iron is a, a great series. That's just like a ton of fun, a little more depth than something like commands and colors, but nowhere near the depth of a levying campaign. So let me ask you, is there one that you're excited about? Oh, um, I could, I just listed them off, uh, like a few weeks ago. I'll tell you that, um, Northern Crusades is already covered by Nevsky. I was super interested in that. Plantagenets. Um, I just got done reading uh, a series of books. Um, I'm going to forget his name, but oh, the one was called War of the Roses by Dan something. Um, and then he's got another one coming to Plantagenets. That's super interesting. Almoravid's up there. There's the Feudal Japan one coming out. Mm, I, yeah. I'm pretty excited for most of the series feudal japan is really cool so i actually uh watched an interview with volka and the question came up does everything is are all levying campaign games going to be in that same four to five hundred year time period just because of the way the system works and the way you design it about how conflict worked during that time and it, this may be years away, but I remember Volker said that he's actually talking to somebody about possibly doing maybe like a Revolutionary War or Civil War Whoa. themed one. And I thought that would be really cool and probably get a lot more people into it because it's just something that they are familiar with. I'd be curious to see how he pulls that off, but uh, th that would be neat too. Well, I, I think what they're doing is is really cool. I'm it's It's cool to hear... Speaking of Volko interviews, you know, Volko has said that coin was more for Euro gamers or, or traditional hobby gamers. And he developed a levying campaign to target war gamers. Ah, oh. um, and, and so it's really cool to hear like it's having the success and reaching this broader audience than I think. And Volko would probably agree with me than he probably intended. Um, I mean, the series is just blowing up, so. Are you on the uh, Levy Campaign Discord channel? I am. Yeah, it's it's crazy that that's like the design space that that's developed there. Like, there's just this community of people, and people like me are just I'm just there watching, really, and asking questions. And then you have these people all contributing to all these different projects, and it's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, let's let's change gears for a little bit. I we may circle back to the war game question because I do have some follow up questions, but let's get another deserted topic out of the sure. way. You mentioned deck builders, and mm -hmm. I'm not going to shoehorn you there, but let's go card game. If okay. you had to wash ashore with a card game, what would you pick? Piece of cake. No, oh. not even a second <laughs> thought. Uh, Arkham Horror the LCG. Oh yes. Hands down, because again, if I'm on a deserted island, assuming I have my entire collection, I'll be playing this game for months and never repeat anything. It's and um, it's probably, it's definitely my top one of my top three games of all time. Wow, and probably my top currently published game. I have never had a card game that to me merged, uh, strategic and thematic so mm. well than this card game. First off, couldn't agree more. I'm laughing because over the last five months, my interest in Arkham Horror card game has been been born again, and I don't know what kicked it off. Just starting to play again with some buddies, and I'm playing more this year than I probably have since Dunwich came out, and it's just been it's been so refreshing to get back to it. Um, I guess you already, you already mentioned it's a blend of mechanics and story, but why why this over something like Lord of the Rings or um or Marvel? Okay, uh, I loved Lord of the Rings, so Lord of the Rings was my first foray into cooperative LCGs. And in fact, when they relaunched, I went and got the starter set. I'm trying to get some people here just to get together and play one off scenarios here here and there. Mm -hmm. What? And I love the Lord of the Rings setting. 
But what I love about Arkham is number one, you're playing as an individual character. I feel more invested in that character mm. with Lord of the Rings. You're playing basically with a, a three heroes and uh, that's kind of your team. Also in Lord of the Rings, you keep playing the scenario over and over again until you beat it. Oh, not so in Arkham. You play one and you're done. There's a result at the end. It could be a bad result. could be a good result. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I love the XP mechanism. When you finish, yes. how much XP do you get? Okay, now you can spend that to upgrade and change your deck. So now I'm growing this character over time. It's like an RPG style card system where my deck is modifying over time. With, with Lord of the Rings, I can totally change my deck. I can change the heroes and do anything I want to. Mm. Not so with uh, Lord of the Rings. They've kind of constricted that. Now compare that to Marvel. I've played a lot of Marvel. I, I had a group of people at work that I would play uh, once a week. I don't feel the story is as strong in Marvel Mm -hmm. as you're playing Arkham Horror. You're reading stuff. You're reading the acts. You're reading the agendas. And once you start playing Marvel, um, well, there's not really a story there. You get get your uh, stuff out. You try to take out uh, minions. You try to take out the villain. I get it down to zero. The game is over. It's kind of the same every... Okay, that's not true. Based on the villain, the villain can really change things up uh you do stick with one hero you are playing as one hero so i do like that part of it and uh, you can modify uh your deck over time but i just am more engaged in arkham plus there have been many marvel games to where literally in the last last round we can actually not have to play the round because we can, as a co-op, we go, you know what? I think I have this to do this, to kill it. As a, mm. I, uh, I think that would be the game. Yeah, I agree. Game over. Never like that with Arkham because you got to always do a <laughs> test and you got to pull a token out of the bag and the auto fail is in there every time you draw. Yeah, uh, I those are great points. I like, um, I, I bought Lord of the Rings and I'm super, the recent reprint, I'm super excited to play it. But compared to... Marvel or even like you know you can pick a you can pick a superhero themed deck builder even and almost compare it but Arkham does check some so many of those boxes you talked about getting the results and I I even think last episode I mentioned like even when you lose I'm still vested in the outcome I'm I still want to know what happens and I'm okay with losing in Arkham and I lose all the time (laughs) Yeah, and I, I 100% agree. I'm invested the whole time. It uh, I love the story that it tells. Also, I absolutely love the map system. This is yes. basically, it's it's a, it's a custom board. Uh, every time you play, a custom map every time that you play. And the first time I saw that demoed at Gen Con, that's the thing that sold me. You create a map out of cards, and every scenario has a different map that you're going to play. There's Fog of War. I, mm-hmm. It's none of the others. Lord of the Rings, Marvel has nothing like that. So on your turn, again, maybe like a tabletop RPG, you got to move your character around. <laughs> yep, you, you just got to fa- you got to face check that that next location. So what's your what's your favorite type of uh, archetype? I honestly I don't have one because I love every time I play I play a different one. So yeah. right now we're playing, I'm playing the uh, Dream Eaters scenario. Mm-hmm. We're, we're a couple of scenario uh, campaigns behind. I have a Mystic that I'm playing, but then also a, a Rogue uh, that I'm playing too. So I've played all of them. There's really not one that I like more than others. Sometimes I want to be the, I believe it's the Guardian. I just want to punch stuff and shoot stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Sometimes it's like, no, 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 no. I want to be the, is it the Seeker that gets clues? Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be a person who just gets clues. That's all I want to do. I don't care about fighting. And because of that, I, I've had the best time just trying out different ones. And every one I have, I, there's always been a character I've kind of loved. Uh, because there's uh, last campaign I played, I played, and I can't remember her name. She's the, she was the track athlete. But she was all about um, not fighting, uh, but evading monsters. Mm-hmm. I built a super sweet deck that literally I could evade almost anything. And I had special abilities that when I evade, it dealt damage to it. So not only was I was evading, I, I was killing things. One of my favorite decks of all time. That's that's funny you mentioned that. A couple months ago, a buddy 
threw down a challenge and we just played the scenario out of the core box, which actually really is far from my favorite of all that I've done in Arkham. But he, the rule was you had to go solo single handed and you had to build a rogue character. Hmm, It could be blended with something, but the main color had to be green. And huh. again, I built same thing, like super evasion. And I just danced around that map. We could just grab and clues, whatever. And then, you know, eventually that that first scenario was, yeah, that's a tough one to, once you get to act three to actually win it. But those first two se- scenarios, man, I was flying around the map, just tiptoeing around guys, grabbing clues. And it was a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah. Not what I would typically go for. I'm more of a, a combat or a mystic myself. Right. Right. That, uh, the mystic that I'm playing now, um, I can't, man, I can't think of her name, uh, but she's the one that basically allows you to pull multiple tokens out of the bag mm. and uh, pick the ones that you want to keep. But if it's a, uh, it's a risk when you do it. Cause if it's one of the, uh, you may be penalized if you pull one that has the, uh, the, the icon on it, like the, the mask or the skull or whatever like that, but she, she's fun. I'll, I'll shift gears here on you. You had mentioned, you know, playing at work. And so, other than other than Tony, what does your because I want to talk about you and Tony in a little bit, what does your your typical game group look like? Or I maybe I get the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that you you play with all kinds of different people. I have a pretty set game group that I get with every week. It's a couple other guys along with Tony, uh, that want to get together every week. We get together at McAllister's Deli. Uh, okay. We used to we used to get together at the game store, but uh, COVID changed a lot of that with their rules and everything like that. And we eventually settled upon this place called McAllister's Deli. It's a it's a well lit place. They don't mind us playing there, and it's kind of in between everybody. So we meet there, we eat a sandwich or something, and then they have big tables and we sit there and just play all night. And they love us being there, uh, so that we never never an issue there. So we always get together like every Wednesday or Thursday. And what we play is basically what we need to cover on the next episode. So uh, my game group is very kind and, and is knows that every time we get together, they're probably gonna have to learn something new, but they're cool with it. That's great. Do you, do you also play games with your family? I, I do. So uh, I have my wife, Vanessa on the show. Every so mm-hmm. often we cover uh, games. She's not as big of a gamer, but there are some things she'll get into and she'll uh, play along with me. She's also very thematic. She's not in, into the heavy Euro stuff. She wants something with a story. So if there's a game, a short game, maybe 30, 45 minutes, a good two player that tells a story, she'll, she'll sit down and play it with me. Uh, the most recent thing that we played, she covered with me on the show was Decorum by Floodgate Games. And we've really been enjoying that uh, somewhat of a deduction game where the theme is something easy to grasp. You're trying to decorate a house. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Good. Uh, let's do another one. Okay. Let's go deserted Island RPG. All right. Mention how much I love the Lord of the Rings LCG. I love the Lord of the Rings universe. So since it's so brand new and I hadn't played yet and I backed the Kickstarter, I'm throwing <laughs> one ring on the list. So it'll force me to sit down and learn how to play this system. Awesome. You're talking about the new, the new update from free league. I'm assuming. Yes. The new awesome. one ring. Yep. Sure is. And I, like I said, I've got sealed pro I'm looking at it right now. I've got sealed product that I'm staring at on my shelf over there that uh i need to open up and play and i've got we've got a wonderful discord channel and they all would yes. love to sit down and play a one shot so what i need to do is is learn how to play say i'll gm and like do a one shot with people on our discord channel just so i can see how the system works i don't know what the changes are from the previous edition uh i didn't look too much into it i played about a year long campaign maybe a year and a half long campaign we played twice monthly of the previous system and mechanically, um, I loved it, and it led me to finally read Lord of the Rings for the first time. I oh, am, wow. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be 33, and I remember seeing Lord of the Rings in middle school when it came out in movie theaters for the first time. And Frodo pushes off the shore with Sam, and then maybe some other things happen, and it cuts the credits. I've never been so mad in my life. Like That was my cl- first cliffhanger experience in movie theaters. 
I had no idea it was coming, but then I finally, I finally have gotten around to reading the books and I, I get why people love the, the lore so much. And then you go and read the book and come to find out that that whole scene right there <laughs> happens in the second book. Yeah. Right, right. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I believe it's, uh, um, uh, my gosh, what's his name? Oh my gosh. I, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting names here. Um, Oh my gosh, the other human that dies. Boromir? Boromir, thank you. I was I was sitting there saying fresh in my brain. boring, but anyway. Yeah, so that whole Boromir fight thing happens at the beginning of the second book. Right. So I think they cut up the movie well to where sure. they went into one chapter of the next book uh, in order to, you know, kind of set a little bit better cliffhanger. Well, I, I hope you enjoy it. I, I thoroughly enjoy the RPG. I, I you know you're in this discovery of historical gaming. I found RPGs um, the year before COVID is when okay. I got into RPGs, which was actually wonderful timing because the most RPGs I've like was during COVID uh, we played. I had to scale back. We had a, a young, our daughter was really young at the time, but like at nights we didn't really do anything. It was COVID and we had a young daughter at home. So it was RPGs all the time. And, oh, that's great. Yeah. So I, I play a, I don't have a regular RPG group. Okay. Uh, I wish I did, but I've played a, a lot of different ones. The, the, the obvious ones, Pathfinder, D and D. I was really into Shadowrun at one time. Nice. But, but boy, that thing is crunchy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Every time I played, I had to kind of like relearn, relearn the rules. Uh, Warhammer fantasy that was just re-released is really cool. Uh, the, uh, age of Sigmar, uh, so, uh, unbounded, uh, yeah, is a uh, is a really cool thing when they got some really cool mechanics in there. So I like dip my toes and tried a lot of different ones. You know, if I had to go mainstream and pick either D and D or Pathfinder, uh, my sons have converted me to Pathfinder. Pathfinder is their number yeah. one. So I've played that more than even D and D. So I'd probably say if I had to go mainstream, I would pick that one. But I thought, you know what? If I'm on a deserted island, one ring's the way to go. So it'll force me to learn how to play. Great pick, great pick. So you, you mentioned your sons; they they play games as well. Oh yeah, so they're mainly into RPGs and uh, Magic the Gathering. And was that so? One of the questions I've you know to g I keep the show somewhat on topic. Uh, I've got a, a two year old daughter and another one soon. Was that a intentional you know interest? Was it an intentional process to get them interested in RPGs or in in Magic and any other games, or was that just something that happened just by virtue of your interest? and Vanessa's interest and it happened organically. Um, I, I guess a little, a little bit of both. So I was into games and I thought, Hey, it'd be fun to play with the kids. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I guess I really kind of got into gaming heavily 13, 14 years ago. And, uh, so I, uh, I was really into CCGs. That's kind of how I got into the board game was I'll do a lot of CCGs. So between 2000, 2010, it was just nothing but CCGs. So I was looking for something to play with my kids. What's an obvious one to play with kids? Pokemon. Mm. Uh, they love the Pokemon video game. So I'd buy some Pokemon starter decks and sit and play with them. That honestly got them to Magic the Gathering. They, they kind of enjoyed that. And then it was like, well, I want to try something else. And I think they went to Oogie for a bit, but eventually landed on Magic the Gathering. And they still play to this day. And there was nothing more fun that I love sitting with my three boys and playing Commander. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, four player Commander. Like over the holidays, we just played every night. And it was, you know, for, for a dad to sit there with his boys and, and play a game like that, it, it meant so much to me. And like uh, uh, two week, two weeks ago, uh, my two, my youngest and my middle are, are in college and we're getting ready to go into finals. And so we went and picked them up and took them out to eat just to kind of get ready for it. And we went to a game store. I said, you know what? I'm buying everybody a commander deck. Let's play commander. So I bought all of us a awesome. commander deck and we just sat there and played for a couple hours. That's so awesome. And that's great. I mean, that's got to be a little bit one of the re I know there's there's so many reasons why we do this you know, for the stories and for learning and for the social aspects, but also, uh, yeah, that that's got to feel great just sitting down and doing that with the family. And the oldest and middle heavily got into miniatures. They they oh, kind yeah. of uh, at first I started playing War Machine. Uh, uh, that was my first miniatures game. 
and um, Adam, my oldest, also played for a little while. But all of a sudden, they they wanted they wanted to get in forty k. They like the sci fi stuff, mm-hmm. and from there, my oldest and middle have g- become really really good painters. In fact, oh. right before I got on the, this recording, and what I'm going to do after this, my son is uh, studying in Montana right now. And he wanted me to send him a bunch of hobby stuff so he could paint while he was there. So he's got a list of Citadel paints that he wants me to throw in a box to ship tomorrow. So I was actually doing a pull for him of a bunch of different paints so he can uh, paint uh, his Tyranids and some other stuff while he's sitting there. At Even though he's not going to play, they just love the art uh, and hobby of assembling and painting. So they are really super into that. They like playing the game too, but they just spent hours just actually just painting. So all that kind of stemmed from here's the board game space and organically they were kind of drawn to the miniature and then got into the hobby of painting. Mm -hmm. Well, you couldn't have laid down a better transition for me. Let's go deserted Island miniature game. Then easy war cry war cry is the skirmish style game of age of Sigmar. So for me between Warhammer, Warhammer 40 K I'm more of the fantasy guy. Okay. And so when Age of Sigmar came out, you know, they did away with the old uh, Warhammer fantasy and came out with Age of Sigmar. I was kind of drawn to that because Lord of the Rings, et cetera. I just just like fantasy more. Age of Sigmar is a fantastic game, but it's a beast on the table. Uh, A lot of units, you know, you're talking multi-thousand point games that takes hours to play. It's like, I just don't have time. Well, ta-da! They came out with, Mm -hmm. a couple years ago, Warcry, which is a game that uses probably 7 to 12 models on a smaller board and it probably takes 30 to 45 minutes and it has a rule set that I just absolutely love. So if I was to go on a desert Island, I know I wouldn't have to take hundreds of models with me, just a handful of models and some stat cards. And I can at least get in some war cry. And what's nice about that too, is I'm not tied to one faction. Mm -hmm. Lots of times in these games, because of how many models are on the table, you can't really branch out to too many factions because it would cost you a fortune. Right. With Warcry only being seven to 12 models, I could easily try multiple factions. Yeah. So another thing that I've recently got into miniature games, that's why it makes the list. Uh, so I obviously understand the fantasy thing. Have you looked at the new kill team at all? I have. And I enjoy kill team also. I do. I I think it's a solid rule system. And basically, to me, Warcry is the kill team version for Age mm-hmm. of Sigmar. Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's really just coming down to, to fantasy versus sci-fi with the slight, mm-hmm. the slight edge to fantasy. Yep. The kill team is yep. great. And if I was to play the sci-fi side, for 100%, it would be kill team. Even over something like, I'm getting ready to cough, excuse me, <coughs> uh, Necromunda. Necromunda uh-huh. was uh, fine. Uh, I just like the setting and, and uh, play style of kill team more than Necromunda. Well, with the newest Kill Team stuff, they've added a lot of the story and campaign elements. And maybe it was there before. I mean, I'm brand spanking new. But there is that role-playing and, like, continued team that has consequences in the new Kill Team stuff, which is one of the selling points of Necromunda. Yep. Oh, okay. Very cool. What uh, what faction do you play in Warcry? Or what your favorite? Uh, well, Night Haunts. Sure, sure with. I guess. Say it again. Night Haunts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, I love uh, the the de- the you know so you you know you have your death and order and death order chaos death order chaos I'm missing one. Oh my gosh! Oh. Death order chaos and oh my gosh! It's whatever the Skaven's in. Um, <laughs> shoot! Somebody, sh- everybody's sh- yelling at the radio. The radio or whatever you listen. Everybody's yelling right now. It's this. Uh, destruction. Uh, so I'm always the death guy. Love the death. Love it. Cool. I just love the theme of that. All the way the models look, you get some really cool powers and stuff. So, yeah. Have you bought much into the, the lore of, of just the whole war, either fantasy or sci-fi reading the books or learning about the facts? Uh, just from playing the game, you know, there's a lot of lore that's in the rule books themselves. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have the age of Sigmar core, core rule book. So I read a lot of the lore and stuff that's in those books. In fact, 
<laughs> again, my two uh, oldest that are into miniatures games, that's they eat that stuff up. As soon as mm-hmm. they get a rule book, they aren't looking at stats, man. They're just flipping through and reading all the lore. And it's ridiculous how much lore. It's ridiculous how much lore they know. Not only from that, from Warhammer Fantasy. So they're big into Total War, Warhammer, 1, 2, mm-hmm. and now 3. Mm-hmm. They're talking... It, just way over my head. It's like you're naming people in places. I, I don't even know what you're talking. You're talking a different language at this point. And they're, they're just so into that video game and it's so in depth and they're just, they soak up all lore stuff in those worlds. The lore is fascinating. It, it, it helps sell the game and, and keep me interested. Um, either on the i tend to lean a little more to the sci-fi stuff i do have some mm-hmm. more cry bands and i've bought some skaven um to do something with it at some point but um the books aren't always the best but even even just learning about the factions in the crazy crazy world that uh, it is and uh there's a new uh edge of sigmar set coming out that has skaven as part of the uh two uh armies in it i just saw that just got announced right it did sure did okay yeah, I, I haven't looked into it in detail because the last thing I need before uh, another baby comes is another <laughs> faction to paint. <laughs> it's Sylvaneth and uh, Skaven that's in the box. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wish we were on camera right now. I could show you the Sylvaneth and the Skaven behind me right now. I I do have, um, oh, what's the card game called? Uh, Underworlds. Underworlds. I have the uh, the Sylvaneth Underworlds painted up at least, mm-hmm. but the trees and the the rats for some reason speak to me. I don't know oh, Warhammer Underworlds is an amazing game. Also, it really is. I was heavy into that when it first started. The card pool got ridiculous for me, mm. and I was like, "Geez, there's just too many cards I got to buy." So when Warcry came out, and to me, it was easier to deal and handle with as new things came out, as opposed to having to keep buying a bunch of cards. I just kind of pivoted towards that. Great. Great. All right. We have one more game you're going to wash, wash ashore with. Um, and that's non war game board game, which is covers like the last 10 or 15 years of your life. since the podcast started. Now I hope that the person that's washed up on shore with me is my wife. And if my wife is there, there is only one game that she will sit and play over and over for hours at a time, and that's the Arkham Horror board game. Wow. She absolutely loves that game. Like I said earlier, it's like, Vanessa, you want to play a game? How long is it? 30 minutes? You say, Are you sure it's 30 and not 45? You know, it's, <laughs> it's very much this discussion. But if uh, I get a new expansion from Arkham Horror, Vanessa, you want to play? Yep, let's play Friday night. And she knows she's going to be sitting down for three to four hours playing and love every minute of it. Like I said, she loves thematic games. And again, that is the third edition is so well tweaked and streamlined now that it is. There's a lot to it, especially setting it up. But as you play the game and the game flows, there's definitely a story there that you're playing. Uh, She loves the character. She loves rolling dice. And I have really gotten into it too. And again, I was thinking of games that if I was stranded on an island, what's something that I could play over and over again and it wouldn't get tiring. And with Arkham Horror, the board game, you have different scenarios, you have different characters, different maps. So every time you play, it could feel different. Yeah, I mean, that does bring up an interesting point. And I've actually never played Arkham Horror, but it is a different question of, hey, what's your favorite game versus, hey, what do you want to be playing Um all all other conditions ideal other than you're stuck on a deserted island what do you want to play for your entire duration there and that's how uh, i approached it so these aren't necessarily my favorite games except for making maybe the arkham heart lcg i was just trying to think if i was stuck on an island and i only had one game on my shelf what's the one i would get tired of the least so i tried to pick something with a lot of replayability like that's why i didn't go euro uh, I know there's some, some years has some variants and stuff, but if you're setting up the board and it's the same way every single time and there's not much difference to it, I thought, well, Euro might get dry, but a good, uh, a mirror trash game would not. Great. Great. And so what about, um, we've already talked about the card game. What about comparing to this, something like, uh, Eldritch Horrors? That's the other one. Again, I've never, I haven't played that or Arkham Horror. Mm. Have you so, so Eldritch Horror we have played. Uh, so it is based. 
around traveling around the world. So Arkham Horror first edition came out, then Arkham Horror second edition, then Eldritch Horror. Eldritch Horror kind of streamlined second edition, but added this concept of instead of being stuck in Arkham, Massachusetts, you're traveling around the world. Arkham Horror third edition took some really good design ideas from Eldritch Horror and threw them back into the third edition and put it back in Massachusetts again. So it's kind of been a natural evolution of that Mm. game over time where you see little tidbits of the previous version come out. And that's kind of where the Arkham Horror third edition lands. And I didn't say Mansions of Madness because I don't know if my iPad's going to be there and I've had to recharge it. (laughs) And that's where I was going to go next. So is Arkham Horror kind of scenario based or? or, Yes. uh, Okay. hundred percent. It is. It is very much like, you know, I mean, the way it works is not like Arkham Horror, the card game, but it's very much at the, as the story starts, you read a little synopsis. And as you go, there's a story that's unfolding and there's a resolution at the end. Okay. Well, I think, I think just based off your history and the relationship you guys have, we should, we should maybe ask about Tony. And I went back, I went back and listened to your first episode from 2012, which actually, wow, you, you may, you may remember this. Um, you talked about Lord of the Rings, the card game, which I assume at that point was the collectible card game. It was, yes. Uh, uh, and you and Tony have a relationship that predates the podcast, obviously. And 2012, you're going to celebrate your 10th anniversary this year. Yeah, in December. Yeah, that's absolutely right. How have you, I mean, Rich and I have a great relationship, but we also live four hours apart and don't see each other a week. How, I mean, it's, I know it's a run in the mill question that you probably get asked, but like, how, how have you and Tony kept it together and kept it going all this time? <laughs> so Tony always jokes that I'm just doing this until you say stop, then I'm stopping. <laughs> so, uh, he, he does a lot of the behind the scenes work with the website, uh, communicating with people. I said, I'll take on all the editing. So we split up a lot of responsibilities so that not everybody is doing everything. And uh, we just said, as long as we're enjoying what we're doing, we're going to keep mm-hmm. doing it. And we always had it. The idea behind the show was that when we were playing all these games, afterwards, we just sit around the table and talk. Or as we're playing the game, we would talk. And the idea is that, well, let's bring people to the table. We just finished a game or it's in the middle of the game. What are we talking about? Oh, well, let's talk about, hey, this drink that we're having is pretty good. All oh, this food we're having is pretty good. Oh, my gosh. I got to get home so I can go home and mow the yard. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. just general conversation that may come up at the table, but in the context of playing a board game. So that's always been kind of our idea. Uh, that was the original concept of just joining a couple of friends sitting at a table chatting and talking and playing board games well it's great and congratulations on on 10 years of of podcasting which um there is so much work that goes into it but it is such an enjoyable uh process and i've i've been a big fan and i i enjoy having you and tony around so congratulations and that really means a lot and it's one of those things people have said have you ever thought about doing this full time and we haven't because if it becomes a job, I don't know that I would enjoy it as much. I, mm-hmm. I, I tell people this, um, at any time I can say we're done and that's it. And it doesn't impact us at all. It's not like I got to go get another job or anything like that. Right. And that's a freedom that I like. I know that at any time if I can just say, all right, this was our last show. Thanks everybody. And then we shut the doors. If this was a full time thing, I couldn't do that. Right. I, I would feel like now I have to do something, man. I don't feel it's night, but I've got to, cause I got to pay the bills. And so we've always said, nah, I, we don't want this to be a full-time gig. And we even enjoyed that freedom of that. Well, not only would that taint the, and obviously people have made great success out of sure. doing that full time, but not only would it taint the, the podcasting process, but also I feel like that would corrupt why, I started talking about war games because it's one of the reasons why I love the U S civil war so much. The the board game is the story that unfolded and we, we played the game so wrong. That first time I played U S civil war, Marty, like our rules were so off, but it still came down to this massive battle. And it's like, all right, if I make this die roll, we're going to keep playing. And 
I feel like you, you would lose that if it's like, oh man, I got to sit down on Thursday night and, you know, I have to do this. And I think that would, uh, I think that's something I want to enjoy either. Yeah. And the people who are full time, I'm not saying they don't enjoy it. They, right. They right. do. But I also know talking to a lot of them that, well, you know what? I need to, uh, I got to make this content because this person's sponsoring this and I got mm-hmm. a deadline and, you know, oh shoot, what we're going to do next. Well, let's make sure we can get a right sponsor so I can cover, you know, you know, every, every piece of content probably needs to be monetized in some way at that point. Right. Right. I mean, <laughs> you, <laughs> the, the latest taste bud song is just, is, is like <laughs> evident of this. It's like, we're and not saying that they can't again, but we have this wiggle room. I think Rich and I spent 30 minutes talking about Stanley Cup playoffs at the end of the last episode. And we warned people like, hey, we're going to go off track here. Yeah. Um, like, but I also enjoy that freedom because I enjoy just hanging out with a buddy, cracking up a beer and talking to hockey, you know? Yeah. No. And, and you know, a lot of people are getting into Twitch streaming now. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I know I've talked to some of the people that are really getting heavy into Twitch to where a lot of their spots are sponsored. So the games they're playing on Twitch are sponsored. Not saying they don't want to play them, not saying they don't enjoy them, but now you're kind of beholden to, well, I really need to make sure I got the subs. I really Mm got to make sure I can get make a little bit of income. So, Hey, we'll play your game on the stream for X amount of money. Again, nothing wrong with it. That's a really good gig. But for me personally, I kind of like the freedom as well. I was going to play this, but we're going to play this instead now. <laughs> and I I think we're in total agreement here, but I also think that lets you do things like circle back to commands and colors ancients. I don't I don't know if there's a big demand for commands and colors oh. ancients stop, but when you hear someone that's passionate about it, that's what I like hearing about. I don't care if the game's 40 years old. If you're enjoying it and you have good or if you didn't enjoy it, if you have good feedback on it, I think that's flexibility that you have. And that's, I appreciate, you know, not that commands and colors ancients is 40 years old, but you get the idea. Yeah. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, I bet you command and uh, command and colors ancients was a segment that a lot of people skipped, but it was like, we wanted to talk about it and we did. And the audience for that probably wasn't as big as if we had talked about the latest expansion of root or something like that, Mm -hmm. but we had that freedom to do that. Right. Right. Well, that, that's good. That's good. It's good stuff. I'm enjoying it. Uh, let's turn the heat up a little bit. Uh-oh. Are you ready? You ready for the hot seat? Not Two really, teams. but you know, we'll, we'll give this a shot. So Tony and I play, uh, sometimes we'll play code names live with, uh, uh, Tim real, uh, on mm-hmm. his Twitch channel. In, in fact, and the end of the code names game, the regular game is where basically you play code names with your partner, but you only have seven seconds to come up with your clue. I stink at that because I'm not that fast. So I'm kind of concerned here. Hopefully I don't blow this too bad being in the hot seat, but we'll see. Okay. Well, it's not history trivia. There's no quiz. It's uh, hopefully these, these are all good things. All okay. Right. Uh, well, we'll start out with the tricky one. Best gaming experience you've had ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. It's a singular gaming experience. Uh, gosh, I've had so many that just immediately popped to mind. I'm trying to think of something that maybe just, uh, sticks out. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of them are very recent. Um, I can think of negative gaming experiences I have, but you said <laughs> the best. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, you know what? I'm, I can't think of a singular, but I'll, I'll say it's around the Arkham Horror board game. Uh, because playing with my wife and maybe some other people, there have been many times playing that game that we're so into it that we're nobody's is any longer sitting at the table. Everybody is standing. Oh yeah. And we're standing for 30 minutes because we, we can't sit. We must see every die roll. We must, you know, see every token that's pulled from a bag. It's it's uh recently we actually had one of those uh we went to a convention in Knoxville called Fun K Town. And we met a person there, two people there uh, that we never uh, met before. And they had wanted to learn how to play the game. So we taught the game in that experience with two brand new people. We were standing up and making the loudest ruckus and people were just staring at us with just <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but when you get that perfect role that you need, and that's what I like about 
I love Euro games. I probably play more Euro games than Ameritrash games, but Ameritrash games tell stories mm-hmm. for me more than a Euro game. I can't think of a lot of Euro games where I can go, oh, I remember that time. Whew. I remember that time I played Carcassonne. Mm-hmm. I laid that tile <laughs> and I got that point right there. Right. That was amazing. You know, that just doesn't happen. But when gonna, it comes down to a random die roll or you yes. or the game is over and you die, you remember that. Yes. I'm going to break my rule here. I'm going to interject. Have you played, maybe you guys mentioned, I can't remember. Have you played Combat Commander yet? I have From not. GMT. Okay. I have not. And I'm not saying necessarily you have to play that one. There's all kinds of tactical scale World War II games out there. So pick your poison. I, that's just one of GMT's um and that's why I picked it. But the reason I like to play tactical games, which are small scale scenario based, you know, grab this church or defend this bridge is the stories that even if you're playing solo, like I know there's a machine gun nest at the end of this bridge, but if we're playing opposed, maybe I don't know. And then you just have these stories about these guys storming a bridge. And maybe they make it across and all this stuff comes down to these amazing stories. And just like you, I love Euro games, but they don't have the same, like hearing you talk about those story moments um, when you get the chance, I, I think you may enjoy if you find the right one, uh, like a tactical scale, uh, war game. Well, then maybe, uh, offline, you can send me a list of good <laughs> entry level ones and I'll, and I'll pick up some, I mean, I've got a, a stack of historical games over here that I still haven't played that Tony and I got to get to play. Like we got Caesar Rome versus Gaul that we need to get to the table. Uh, we just got fire in the sky from Phalanx games. Yes. Uh huh. Um, so, and these are still in shrink, you know, we just got to find the time to sit down and get together and, uh, play these things. But yeah, I may have to say, you know, give me a list of some and, uh, and we'll go buy one and try it. Yeah. Well, you be careful because then you'll end up in advanced squad leader land and then. Oh, ASL. Yeah. Don't know anything about it, but I hear a lot about it. Yeah. Find, find someone local to teach you. That's how I learned. I swore it off for years. I swore it off. And then I, and then I was like, all right, I'll try it. And now it's, it, it lives up to the hype, but I also learned from other people. It's not a, like, you can't read the rule book and anyways. All right. Uh, favorite shipwreck based themed movie, TV show, or book. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Start that again. Favorite shipwrecked. Yeah. Ship, a uh, shipwreck themed movie, TV show, or book. Oh, huh, this is easy. Gilligan's Island. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so two guests are correct. I don't even remember what the other person said, but if it's anything other than Gilligan's Island, you can, <laughs> come on. I mean, it's a, it's a shipwreck. It's like it's right in the title of the theme song. <laughs> we used to sing the theme song to my daughter when she was one. She was obsessed with it. And here's what's so crazy is like you're very young to have been have seen. I mean, we're getting to the point where people are like Gilligan. What? Yeah. <laughs> so you, I'm I'm big into tiki. I like making tiki cocktails and the whole Hawaiian shirts and everything. And my wife bought me some tiki glasses. And I said, how did you know that I loved Gilgan's Island? I loved watching repeats. Like when I'm at my grandparents' house or whatever, and you turn on like Nick at night or whatever, whatever it aired on. And she's like, I didn't even, what's Gilgan's Island? Or I didn't oh. even know those were Gilgan's Island's glasses. She just happened to get them and they, they were Gilgan's Island themed. So that's awesome. Uh, favorite video game console. Oh, that's a good one. Five years ago, I would have, I would have said the uh, GBA SP, mm-hmm. but since then, it's the Switch. Yeah, I know it's the latest, but I swear the Switch is one so amazing piece of hardware. So good. Yep. Uh, who wins the Stanley Cup this year? I hope the Hurricanes. Yes. Uh- Okay, good. I was going to ask if you were a hurricane. My wife and I traveled to Raleigh a couple of years. We're big Hurricanes fans, so yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, by the time this comes out, it'll be over. But as of right now, it's 2-2 <laughs> with Boston. Right. So <laughs> uh, not, a, not a Boston fan at all. So I'm hoping uh, tomorrow night goes a little bit better than the last two. I'm two a Caniac. Yes, yes. Uh, what game's on your table right now? Uh, board game on my table? Mm-hmm. Huh. this is funny it's nevsky because i'm setting it up again to play with <laughs> ignasi pretty soon awesome uh favorite uh commander for mtg commander oh man 
I stink at knowing the names of commanders. <laughs> um, I have a, a vampire dude that's really cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm here's the thing. Another this is one of those things too. My boys, you know how every color combination has a name. Uh huh. You know they know them all. Okay. And it's like, oh, it looks like you're playing a blah 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 deck, and I I, I don't know what that is. Oh well, that's uh you know that's blue red white. I don't know. Right. And uh, I, I I don't know. I said, just give me a deck and play. Okay. I, I'm not good at it. I don't keep up with it, but uh, I, I really enjoy playing. I'm trying to get my friends into it. Tony really doesn't care for the game at all. Mm. Mm. He just thinks it's boring. So it's probably dead on the table if he ain't going to play it. Mm. Uh, favorite snack food? Peanuts. Okay. Boiled peanuts or just regular peanuts? Uh, is this gaming or not gaming? Uh, what washes on the island for the only only regular peanuts or boiled peanuts are allowed to wash ashore? Which one? Well, they're going to be soggy. So once they're <laughs> there, I could boil them. And we'll just say boiled peanuts. Okay. Uh, what's a war game you're most looking forward to playing? <sighs> looking back over. I am. I'm very intrigued. Have you played Caesar Rome versus Gaul? So good. Yes. Is it? It's yep. a card based game, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. I love card games. And so I'm very intrigued by the theme of that one and also the card play mechanics. Yeah. It's a little, um, I like to describe it as, and this is not a bad thing at all, a little like whack-a-mole um, for the Romans. Like you got to whack the Gauls and they keep popping up. And it's it's a little bit like just familiarity with the cards, but not not something like Twilight Struggle where like you know like people are like memorizing decks and mm. anticipating moves. Um, I'm a huge Mark Semenich fan. That's the designer of Caesar Rome versus Gaul, and it delivers. Yeah, I like that game a lot. Cool. Uh, favorite Switch game? Uh. I had to pour one out for Metroid Dread. I love that oh, game wow. last year. Uh, Metroid is my favorite series, and I had waiting. I have waited years for another Metroid game, and Metroid De a Dread delivered for me. I loved it. Favorite lawn and garden tool? Or mm. piece of machinery. My zero turn mower. <laughs> uh, what's the best deck builder? Oh, great question. Wow, that one's really good. What is my favorite deck guy? There's some so many good ones now. You know what? I'll throw some love. This is a historical game. I'm going to say Undaunted. I wow. think I, I love. Here's here's the thing I love. I I love. I don't like pure deck builders anymore. I love a game that uses deck building as the important mechanism of the game. Okay. Which is why I think uh, Clank was really popular. Uh -huh. I think that was good. Tyrants of the Underdark yes. is a is an area control game, but used deck building. I love that game. Lost Ruins of Arnak, uh, which we just uh, played the expansion, and I'm going to do a review for it on the show. Clever deck mechanics, but it's, it's heavy Euro. Undaunted is a war game that has deck building in it. Nice. Okay. Uh, if you could have one book wash ashore with you, which book? Oh, you could either get deep and philosophical or have fun. <laughs> uh, we'll go try to go the fun route. Um, one book it needs to be long. <laughs> Here's the thing. Even though it's three books, I said Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, was, yeah, you know, it's been printed as one, so you can just, it works for me. Yeah, I actually have uh, it all combined into one book, so yeah. There you go. Okay, what about one movie? Well, I can't say Lord of the Rings because it's three mm. different movies. Um, one movie. What is one movie that every time it comes on, I have to sit and watch it? Monty Python's Holy Grail. Nice. Okay. That's, you know what? Lord of the Rings, like you catch it on like TNT or whatever. And it's like, ah, I got to sit it. Like I own it. <laughs> I don't know. Watch it through and, the and commercials. It's like, oh, well they're playing the one. Oh, they're playing uh, two towers <laughs> right after this. Well, I, I got to continue now. <laughs> uh, what about one video game? 
one video game. Oh, okay. Again, so I have all the hardware to play and everything, and I can get countless hours out of it. I'm a huge Guild Wars 2 fan. That's my favorite MMO of all time. And I know I'll be able to play many, many, many hours of Guild Wars 2. Awesome. Uh, last great game you played? Oh, Crescent Moon. Oh. Uh, from, from Osprey Games. Uh, is at okay. the time, as the time of this recording, we're getting released a review of that game. And right now, that's my game of the year. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is an area control. Oh, man, it's even more than I here's here's the games I compared it to. And I put this in our review. I said it has a little things that remind me of Root, things that remind me of Pax Premier, things that wow. remind me of Cuba Libra. Wow. You know, what? I just clicked over to it. And at some point I listed it in my wish list. So at some point it came on my radar, but I yeah. don't remember where. There's a concept of controlling a, a, a tile. There's a concept of having influence in a tile. You don't have to control it to have influence. There's four different uh, factions. They all work differently. One's better at combat. One's better at influence. One's better at managing money. You want more money, kind of like the syndicate and Cuba Libra. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that'll probably bump up the list a little bit. Um, favorite pinball machine? Let's go old school. Black hole. Oh, I don't know if I played that one. Uh, classic, classic table uh, from the early 80s. It was one of the first multi-layer table or, or two, two, okay. uh, is it two layer, two deck table. Uh, there's basically an upper and lower level. Nice. Have you been to the Asheville Pinball, Asheville Pinball Museum? Many times. The oh, boys yeah. love to go there and we'll just stay there all day. And in fact... Uh, now we've turned our attention to Southern Fried Gaming Expo that happens in yes. Atlanta, Georgia in the middle of July. That is now a family destination every year. And if you want to play pinball and old classic arcade games all weekend, go there. Yeah, that's, yep. I, I picked that up in your Discord. Um, won't be able to go, but that's where the pinball uh, came from. Which brings us to favorite arcade game? Tempest. Okay. Followed okay. closely by Robotron, twenty eighty four. I'm, I'm actually a, uh, better at Robotron than I am at Tempest, though. If I'm going old school, I am a Joust man, which predates <clears> me. But I love, love Joust. That is that is a solid game. I'm not good at it. I played it in its heyday when it came out, and uh, I was never that good at. It. I couldn't. I always flapped the wings too hard and ran into one of the stupid nines and died. I had trouble controlling my altitude with the flapping. <laughs> uh, favorite Lord of the Rings character? Oh, great question. Great question. The scholarly thing to say is Sam. <laughs> because he's actually the hero of the book. But I'll go Legolas. I love a good old elf that can sure. <laughs> that's good at archery. And like... Here's the thing. Whenever I play RPG characters, man, it's going to be ranged. 100% okay. of the time, I love ranged characters. So he's the ranged character in that party. I can't make this up. My next question is you're starting to play a new fantasy RPG. What class do you play as? Okay. Uh, well, that's funny because now it's not really ranger. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, now that you put the question in front of me, actually, I like hybrid healers okay. and attackers which would make a cleric. Cleric okay. is actually one of my favorite. That's funny. I say I love playing range characters, and here I just said cleric, which uses melee. But anyway. A favorite item from a taste bug segment? Favorite item? Yeah, so for those who are wondering, what the heck is a taste bud? It's on our shows where we try randomly try drinks and food that we found, and now it's becoming a thing where people are actually mailing stuff to us. <laughs> to try so um you know what i, I uh, one of our listeners uh julia sent us uh dragon fruit to try which i had never tried before mm. and that ended up being some very very good fruit that i thought i would never try because this looks very disgusting but it mm -hmm. was really good okay uh what's the best city in the united states to get barbecue lexington north carolina hmm. uh, that's kind of like the barbecue capital around here you were so close to passing. 
Oh, what 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 is it? Oh, it's well, it's Kansas City. There's no doubt. About oh, it. well, no. <laughs> that is well, uh, obviously right. So people in Texas will say, uh uh-uh. oh, right, right. So you know, it just depends on on where you're from. Yes, I totally get it. People in Kansas City have their style of barbecue. <laughs> is it pork there? So it's usually a dry rub, and then I guess if you had to pick a cut, were burn ends. So brisket burn ends are kind of Kansas City's thing, but, but usually a dry it, rub with. Uh, but is, uh, it, is it beef, beef or pork? Beef, beef, yeah, beef brisket. Ah, well, see, that's the thing. Here it's pork. Yep. Uh, so a pork barbecue is is kind of, is kind of the main thing here. And then you have my gosh, the three different types of sauces: mm-hmm. Western North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina. And South Carolina, so South Carolina is mustard based. Yep. Western North Carolina is tomato based. Eastern is vinegar based. When last time we were in North Carolina, we we got some barbecue and it was it was good. It, it, it was very good, is what I'll say. Well, but not the best. Yeah. All right, you can you can breathe. You can you can rest easy. Oh, that was fun. Good. That good. good. I hope. It- I like stuff like that. It's it's always fun to talk about your favorites and things like that. So all the time you get stuck is like, uh, like favorite commander. Uh, that <laughs> one that has that really cool power. That's really cool. I like that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for giving up your evening, coming by and just, just chatting about games. I I've mentioned this in, but it'll be, at the point this is, it'll be a few weeks old that I, I love when people talk about things that they're passionate about. So whether you're talking about the boys getting into the miniatures or just Arkham or any of that stuff, it's, it's always a great conversation for me. Um, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. It is so, I I love, I was gonna say, it's so fun going on other people's shows and, and chatting. One is just because you get to meet and talk to new people, which is exciting, and maybe talk about things you don't get to. But the main benefit is I don't have to edit this, and that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I was telling you off air that well, I don't I don't have to edit this either because on interview shows I usually go pretty free or free and easy and however the cards fall. But I'll I'll do some cleaning up and but thank you again hey where can uh you want to plug all your stuff and where people can find you online in the discord channel and all that stuff oh sure sure so uh, basically all of our and all of our information is on our website roll dice take names.com and there we have links for our instagram and um twitter which is at dice and names on both of those uh we have the link there for our discord channel which is uh is, is an amazing community of people it is very the, the Discord channel really reflects the show. We sit there, talk about anything and everything. People are very friendly and kind to each other. No drama, et cetera, which is uh, really nice. And uh, if you're just looking for the podcast, uh, you know, we're on I- iTunes. You can tell Alexa to play us. We're on Spotify. So wherever you listen to your podcast, you'll probably find us. Just look for Rolling Dice and Taking Names. Awesome. All right. Well, that's going to do it. Someone better go check on Tony. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back. This, this, I think this is the last uh, Desert Island Dads to air. So if you're listening to this, uh, Rich and I should be back in August with a, uh, with a fresh episode. Woo-hoo! Can't wait. All right. Thanks, Marty. Thank you.